What percentage of Israelis do you think look at Palestinians as human? A very small percentage. The, the, the minority, the, the Jewish voices who call for Palestinians' rights, uh, I would say 5%. The vast majority of Israelis, they don't consider us as a human beings. Since October 7th, the eyes of the world have been on Gaza. Israel's ongoing military operation there has killed, according to Palestinian sources, more than 25,000 people, not to mention the almost 300 members of the IDF who have also been killed. And yet, despite that massive loss of life, Israel remains nowhere near realising its political objectives. Broadly speaking, the dismemberment of Hamas. There are still Hamas police officers in the streets of Gaza. And yet, war goes on. Benjamin Netanyahu is still the Prime Minister of Israel directing their war effort. But what next? Where does this go? How does it end? Well, according to today's guests, there needs to be a political solution that benefits both Israelis and Palestinians alike. That isn't just useful, helpful, it's necessary. And if suffering's to be avoided, inevitable. He's originally from Gaza, but has been in the UK acting as a journalist for 10 years. He came over originally to study. He now runs one of the largest Instagram pages highlighting what's going on in Gaza, posting videos and updates every day about the latest events there. Yosef Al-Hallu, welcome to Downstream. Thank you for having me. You're originally from Gaza. Tell us a little bit about your background, where you were born, where your family's from? I'm from Gaza City. I was born there. I spent most of my life there. Uh, I know Gaza street by street. It's a very small piece of land. I attended my primary education at United Nations run schools. And I did my secondary school uh, at Jaffa School uh, in the heart of Gaza City. And um, I've got two master degrees, one in journalism and another one in international relations. I was lucky in the year 2013, I was awarded a scholarship to do journalism fellowship at the time. And uh, most of my family, they live in Gaza City. So they are still living there. So you've been in the UK for how long? 10 years? Yeah, almost 10 years. And you've been back to Gaza how many times over that period? Only once. I was lucky. Only one month before this genocidal war. And I was really glad that I made that decision to go. And what was that like when you were there? Obviously, this was before all the events that we've seen unfold. Oh, it was a jubilant uh, atmosphere. Uh, the family received us, me and my wife and um, our relatives. Uh, and I was surprised that Gaza um, has become more advanced in terms of some infrastructure, some uh, resorts, um, um, hot hotels, uh, restaurants, cafes. I enjoyed my time. Uh, I'm not used to hot weather because I've been living here in the cold temperature, but it was fun. I enjoyed it. Uh, I rarely had uh, much sleep because I wanted to see everything mm. before we go back to school term for the children. So what was life like growing up? So you would have been growing up, what, in the 80s, 90s? Uh, what was it like at the time in Gaza? So in the 80s, I experienced the first intifada, the first uprising. Uh, I grew up on the sound of explosions, Israeli shootings, uh, um, burning houses, demolitions, uh, curfew at the time. Uh, people had to be indoors before um, seven in the evening. Um, you know, bad infrastructures, uh, closed roads. Uh, I had to hide many times from Israeli soldiers. I saw dead bodies in front of my eyes. Um, I didn't enjoy my childhood. That's why the Palestinians of Gaza, they aspire to visit the whole world to compensate um, their denial of being a free nation. So, but, you know, I enjoyed my time going to the beach, going to the market. Uh, we have big family from my father's side, mother's side. I only been once in my life to the other part of Palestine, West Bank, Jerusalem, only once when I was seven years old. I traveled to so many countries around the world, almost 30 countries, but not to occupied Palestine, West Bank and, and Jerusalem. So growing up with those explosions, with the IDF and so on, that's obviously something now which has intensified. As somebody who's experienced that as a young person, as a child, what, what does that do to you? Because it feels to me that watching what's going on in Gaza, best case scenario, we can talk about ethnic cleansing and so on in a moment, best case scenario, you're giving more than 2 million people PTSD. 
really significant mental health trauma. How did that play out for you personally, experiencing that as a young person? Well, of course, this affects the personality of young people. Uh, it might push people to believe in the armed resistance. Uh, it might push young people uh, to adapt to the situation. This has influenced my personality in the sense that I wanted to become a journalist at a very young age because um, I was frustrated to see uh, my people being killed uh, for a long time. I was born in the early 80s and uh, seeing these ambulances, the sirens and destruction and killing, obviously this has reshaped my personality. Uh, it creates frustration and anger and uh, a sense of desperation, a sense of, you know, we uh, long for freedom and liberation. And this has uh, pushed me to uh, have an idea in my mind to travel the whole world, uh, and also to become a journalist, to tell the story of the Palestinian people in Gaza. And uh, as a result, I became a journalist, and I traveled to so many countries, and I became outspoken. Uh, I was lucky I was awarded a scholarship at Oxford, uh, the Palestinians of Gaza, they aspire to improve their livelihoods by going to universities. So I hail from a middle class uh, family. I have big uh, family, brothers and sisters. And sadly, I lost my sister and her children in this genocide, eight members in total. And it's very sad that um, I'm not there to comfort them and to, you know, feel how they feel. Um, but obviously, maybe I'm lucky that my children are safe here in the UK. So you mentioned that you've got a family over here, you've been here for 10 years, you've got kids. Are they half Palestinian or both parents? Yeah, both Palestinians. Both both parents. So and how, how old are they? Oh, between 17 and seven. 17 and seven. Okay. That's a that's a long that's a long range. How are you to the younger one um, in particular, how are you explaining all of this to them? How are you how are you making sense of these events which have, have included your own sister? Well, the eldest three daughters, they experienced four wars in their uh, age time. My youngest, he didn't, uh, luckily, he didn't experience any, any war. Obviously, when I explain the situation, we say, we Palestinians, we were living peacefully in that part of the land. 1948, Israel all of a sudden decided to occupy Palestine based on uh, a promise from Milford Declaration, assisted by the UK, the US administration. And um, also, that is the historical injustice. Palestinians have a right to live in that part of the world. Um, um, when they say the Palestinian flag, the kofiya, of course, uh, we teach them this is the symbol of justice. We are proud of our history, our culture, our roots. Uh, I say this is Palestine. This is Al-Aqsa Mosque. You know, facts. We don't, you know, create full, you know, false facts. You know, history is there. They can read. They have the internet. Uh, they see that I'm a journalist. They ask questions. Uh, I say, this is what happened. We educate them. It's, it's like a school. Uh, we have a moral duty to educate our children like we are raising awareness with non-Palestinians. So we are not inciting them to do anything harmful to others. You just, we, we raise them to a certain standard to open up their minds and say, this is right. This is wrong. This is just. This is unjust. And if you don't mind me asking, so you've got three older daughters, or two older daughters, three older daughters, lucky man. Um, how, how, how do they want to contribute out of curiosity? Because obviously you feel you have a sense of obligation, uh, and that's through your work and through your journalism to tell the truth. So, I mean, you have an insight into younger British Palestinians that I simply don't. How do they want to contribute? How do they see, do, do they say, you know what, I'm going to make the best of myself. I want to become a doctor or an engineer, be the best person I can be because then I can help my compatriots, or is it, I need to get involved in politics, shape the political process. How do younger British Palestinians view their contribution? Uh, I wouldn't intervene in their choices, uh, but they are proud of their cultural heritage. During the cultural day, they wear the Palestinian embroidery dress, wearing the kofiya, the flag. Um, one of them said she wants to become a lawyer, international lawyer, uh, to try to help Palestinians' voices. Um, the other one, she says, wants to uh, become um, a designer uh, to design Palestinian clothing. Um, you know, the other one wants to maybe to have a Palestinian restaurant to educate people about our rich cuisine. And uh, so the, it's, it's different ways. 
um, I, I wouldn't force them to do anything against their will. Um, at some point, one of them said she wants to become a journalist to raise awareness and to educate other people. Uh, I'll leave it to them. And on a more somber note, you, you mentioned you've lost your sister over there. Um, your sister and, and who else? And She's the family? eldest sister uh, with her seven children. And the, the youngest was only one month old. He was, during, was born during this war. So she and how many of those children passed away? Seven and her, eight in total. All the seven, children died? All of them, they were killed under the rubble. The Israeli and Israeli airstrike uh, struck the house, five-story building, and they are still under the rubble until this moment. They were killed last December. Wow. So the youngest of one month old, how old was the oldest? Eldest is uh, 17. Wow. And how old was your sister? Uh, 35. Wow. Almost 35. Yeah, she was the eldest. And uh, I was glad and lucky that I saw her and I saw her children uh, before she's killed now. And I remember we, on my last day in Gaza, I took them to the beach and we had a lovely uh, lunch and we stayed until midnight and we had gossip and we enjoyed our conversation. And she said, please don't uh, be too long before you visit us again. Uh, next time I'm going to go and visit her grave. And what did she do? Just housewife. Housewife, you've got seven children, of course. Yeah. And yeah. Her, husband, her husband's still alive? Uh, he was injured. Um, yeah, but my concern is my sister now because, you know, she's part of my family. And uh, uh, I still have the photos and pictures of uh, of her and her children. Uh, they have blue eyes and green eyes and blonde. Because mm -hmm. Israelis, they would annoy, uh, would be annoyed to, see, to, pre to portray Palestinians are, you know, thugs and, you know, brown skin. But whereas, you know, uh, like Ahed Tamimi, uh, many media artists, they tried to discredit her because she was blonde. So people, Palestinian people come from different backgrounds. Uh, and uh, as a society, you know, uh, everybody's suffering nowadays. Almost everybody in Gaza lost somebody. Uh, I lost my neighbors. I lost uh, journalists, colleagues. 122 journalists killed so far. And it was risky for me when I was reporting from Gaza. Uh, obviously... Uh, no one is immune from these attacks. And civilians continue to pay the heavy price, children. When I see, when I watch these videos of children at hospitals, corridors with blood and icy units full of bloods and plasters, uh, that's too much to handle. So many heartbreaking videos I've seen and I can't share because of the sensitivity. Of course. And I wonder, do, they, do, do Israelis see these videos? Because some... Israelis, they uh, joined one of my lives and they sent comments. They say, you journalist, you should call for Hamas to release the hostages. You are really involved. You all of you are Hamas. Like, and I haven't seen any of those journalists. They shared any video of tens or hundreds of thousands of videos of Palestinians killed and maimed and bloodshed and amputations because they don't care about us. And they want to dictate on, dictate on us how to report and not to report and what to say. And so... They ask for too much, and they don't. They are not willing to do things to show their humanity to us. So the oldest child of your your sister was you said seventeen. Yeah. What did they want to do? Uh, one of them, they wanted to become a journalist like me. He wanted to uh, to say, my uncle, I would like to, I would like to follow your footsteps, and I would like one day to travel the world. The second wanted to become an accountant, and uh, so uh, two boys and uh, five girls, seven in total. And the old, the, the, these boys, what were their names? Um, Sorry, because really, they're, not, they're not with us anymore. I think it's really important to acknowledge these I'll, people. I'll, I'll just uh, keep it private. Okay. Because I think th these, are, these are lives that will never be lived now. Yeah. And so uh, it's, it's, it's very heartbreaking that uh, I'm talking about this. It's very emotional for me. Of course, uh, of course, of course. It's very, it's very brave uh, of you to do so. Barat, Barat, Majid, Maryam. Uh, it's, it's really painful for me. May they rest in peace. Yeah, inshallah. You mentioned education. I mean, it seems to me that uh, Palestinians have an immense respect for education. You have what is objectively a, a very poor country, a very poor quasi-state, low GDP, and yet despite that, very high rates of literacy comparatively for, for economic status, very high levels of people entering university. One of the things I've heard is that is why the Israelis have targeted universities, precisely because Palestinians have this impulse for self-improvement, for education, for, for 
bettering themselves. What, what do you make of that? For us, education is indispensable. Uh, even poor families, they strive to attend universities, even if they have to borrow money, uh, even if they have to uh, ration their food and just save some money to go to uni. uni. I think um, Israel's intention to destroy the education system stems from the fact that um, there are lots of uh, graduates and uh, those graduates are in different fields. So six of Gaza's university have been destroyed uh, obviously, Israel wants to increase the literacy and, you know, push young people towards, uh, you know, adopting, um, you know, armed struggle because it wants to uh, justify its attacks by saying that, you know, the Gaza population, they are ignorant, they are not educated, and they just use violence. Um, in addition to those six universities, almost 300 schools were either totally or partially destroyed. Uh, so this year, this academic year is lost. Can you imagine that, you know, for almost uh, four or five months, students haven't attended the school in Gaza. So you're saying there that for Israel, it's an intentional strategy to not just brutalize people, but to actually make them less educated, to push them towards violence, because that legitimizes the present occupation. Now, they would deny this, but uh, there's no other justification for bombing those universities and schools at the time where people have been sheltering at those United Nations schools and governmental schools. Um, I, I think they just want to ruin the civil life in Gaza. And education and schools and universities are a major pillar of any um, you know, civic life. Um, because I cannot think of any other excuses why they would target universities and schools and educational centers and uh, heritage sites and ancient sites, the Al Pasha mm -hmm. Palace, Al Amri Mosque, and so many other sites have been destroyed. It just want to level Gaza and raise it to the ground in order to kill any chance of life to make Gaza unlivable. So where are those students gonna go now? Universities destroyed, no schools and to repair the schools and to get back to normality. This will require many years for people to get to recover from the trauma. What do you make of the line that Israel has the most humane army in the world? The IDF is the most humane army in the world. This is a joke. You know, because you cannot claim to be a moral army. When we see you, when the whole world see you, that you are intentionally targeting civilians and killing animals, um, horses and, uh, you know, the sheep the other day, and many other examples, shooting women in the head just outside Nasser Hospital, shooting uh, children. There are, all these crimes are documented. And from day one, we have seen the, you know, uh, premediated attacks on residential areas, um, you know, uh, controlling explosions, destroying entire residential areas, um, and also attacking mosques, churches, um, all aspects of life. So there is an intention to destroy the civil life in Gaza and push people to leave. And this is falls under the category of ethnic cleansing um, because Israel is annoyed or they are worried from the uh, demograph demographic growth. You have 2.5 million people and this is a ticking bomb to Israel in the south. Uh, so it will just wants to make life hard for Palestinians in Gaza in order to push them to leave if there is any chance. Leave to go where? to go to the desert, mm -hmm. to go to Arab countries, to go to Europe. But we know uh, that um, Arab countries do not absorb or take any refugees. I think the only access, uh, the only way for those people, disparate people, especially young people, is Europe. And I think Europe have to, um, to tackle this uh, migration problem, unless if they come up with some uh, schemes, like the Ukrainian schemes, to absorb a percentage, especially uh, us uh, British Palestinian Gazans, we would like our families to be with us. We are not helping the Israelis to empty the land, but at least we, we want to make sure that they are safe even at temporary bases. Yeah, something I say often to, to conservatives in this country, who obviously are the first to complain about refugees or migration. Um, my dad's Iranian. My dad was a, a refugee. Well, he had the right to remain after the revolution and the war in Iran um, and Iraq in the 80s. And I say, well, look, you don't want people coming to Europe, but on the other hand, you have foreign policy preferences, which are leading to occupation, war, sanctions. And there's an incongruence between your foreign policy and, and your professed, you know, we don't want people coming here. We'll stop purposely displacing millions of people. And we have a really 
perfect example of it with Palestine because Palestinians don't want to come to Europe. Mm. They want a country, yeah. right? It's And it completely disproves this whole right-wing talking point. Billions of people want to come to Europe. They want a country. They want safety, security, prosperity, like everyone else. And yet, for some reason, um, and my experience is Britain, conservatives, well, people on the right, not all of them, most of them, don't seem to understand this. Yeah. So we have uh, refugees in the exile. They are longing for the moment to go back to Palestine because they have had enough from being in exile, um, you know, being foreigners in other countries. And um, Europe has a moral responsibility, especially Britain, that granted a bill for declaration to the Jews to come and, come and establish their state at the ruins and at the expense of the Palestinian people who are the indigenous population. So why we have to suffer uh, in order for the Israelis to have a state? We were not responsible for the Holocaust. So why we are being punished? Why, why we are being stripped and dispossessed of our inalienable rights? Uh, we have a right in that part of the world. Uh, obviously, they will tell you uh, the land is too small. Netanyahu has said that he will not allow a Palestinian state. And this goes against the, the European Union, the international communities, mm -hmm. well, um, the Saudi initiative. So they will tell you, um, you know, uh, we don't trust Palestinians. If we give them a state, they might, you know, rearm themselves and they might attack us. So they are looking for um, a viable uh, state with no army, with no... So yeah. why, why Israelis, they have the right for everything, mm -hmm. while Palestinians are denied that right? Um, so this problem, the Middle East will be uh, volatile as long as Israel occupies Palestinian land. There will never be stability in the Middle East without a just solution to the Palestinian uh, problem, including the right of refugees to return back to where they were driven out back in 1948. So I'm a descendant of a refugee. Why we are not allowed to go back and live in historic Palestine, which is Israel now, whereas any Jew, any person who claims to be a Jew has a right to go and make a liar, granted citizenship, yeah. given a Palestinian home to live in, whereas Palestinians, indigenous, are being pushed to vanish. Or even anyone who converts to Judaism. Yeah, As anybody a, can claim to be there. I saw a, a British Egyptian guy who's converted to Ju Judaism, and I, I like, who, or there was this case, wasn't it, recently of um, South American um, uh, Jewish people who had they were speak they speak a dialect of Incan. Mm. Now, if you saw this, and they were they were working for the IDF in in Gaza, and you think, what on earth is happening when you have people from South America speaking a, a, a dialect of Incan, you know, indigenous South American language? And they are dispossessing people in Gaza in the name of a homeland thousands of miles away from Peru or wherever the hell they're from. And it doesn't make any sense to me. But what I would say is everything you've said is very clear cut, particularly about um, the role of Israel in the wider volatility and chaos of, of West Asia has been the case for decades. Some people could say, well, the blame is also with the Arabs or whatever, Egypt, Jordan, mm. park that for a moment. Clearly, it's it's been a central factor in all of that. Why can't decision makers and policymakers in Europe and North America understand that? I think uh, they still suffer from the stigma of, you know, being responsible for the Holocaust. They don't want to criticize Israel. Uh, Israel still blackmails Europe, blackmailing, uh, extorting Germany until this moment. So anybody who dares to criticize Israel will uh, be called anti-Semitic. Um, uh, but Germany, that makes sense, right? Mm. Germany has a historic sense of guilt, entirely understandable. I mean, Britain, far less so. The United States, not at all. Uh, I think they just want to remain silent in order to um, refrain from being called anti-Jews. They uh, uh, want to strip the Jews their, their right to have a state. Um, but I can tell you something. Europe... Uh, is the replacement of the U.S. Palestinians, they don't trust uh, the United States because it has never been uh, an honest peace broker. So Europe, the U.K., they have a moral responsibility to correct the historical injustice that happened in 1917 when Bill for Declaration was announced and Palestinians have been suffering ever since 1948. For the past 75 years, we have been languishing you know, under this occupation. We have been used as hostages. We are being collectively punished by Israel's uh, criminal policies. The siege in Gaza is a collective punishment. 
And when Israel decided to cut electricity, water, and starve the population in Gaza, also this is a clear violation of international law. They cannot convince us or convince you or the world that their war is against Hamas. This is a war, a genocide against the every single person who lives in Gaza, even UNRWA, even international staff, even those dual citizenship uh, holders that are being targeted. So um, I think uh, there is hypocrisy, there's international liberal policy, and the world has to intervene to stop Israel's impunity. This impunity must end. With the ICG ruling, Israel is still violating international law, still killing and destroying. They don't care. So this culture of impunity has to end because this will be copied somewhere else. Uh, if a war broke out somewhere, those countries, uh, they will say, well, look, Israel attacked hospital, hospitals, Israel killed civilians. So Israel is setting a you know, unprecedented um, you know, system. It, ha it actually has sabotaged the international system. We don't believe anymore in the international law uh, conventions and treaties. So, uh, and the Israelis, you know, they, they brag us. They say, you know, all of you Gazans are complicit of what's happened on the 7th of October. All journalists are pro-Hamas. Um, you were celebrating in the streets of Gaza. So this shows that they don't consider us as a human beings. They consider us as subhumans. They continue to demonize us in order to justify their attacks. And this has to stop. This collective punishment has to stop. But again, I, I sort of want to go back to this question. Why does the West accept this thing? You said partly it's the Israel lobby, partly worries about anti-Semitism, partly a sense of historical guilt, totally understandable with Germany. But like you say, um, a number of countries have been central in trying to establish a certain quote-unquote rules-based order, overwhelmingly to the advantage of the United States, of course, overwhelmingly to the advantage of the global north and so on. But there is a global system which benefits those countries, by the way, um, that's why they have sought to defend it. And yet Israel is sabotaging that system and it's clearly not to their interest. So like you say, Israel has a sense of impunity when it's doing this in Gaza. Tomorrow it could be Iran annexing a part of Afghanistan or Russia annexing a, you know various parts of whatever, wherever. We're seeing something similar right now in Ukraine, but you know part of Georgia. And they can make the exact same arguments, historical land. By the way, Russians are the people that cities like Kurs and, and Odessa in Ukraine, those were Russian-speaking cities. So the exact same argument holds that the Israelis are making. Actually, it's far more recent than 2,000 years ago. And like you say, this whole international system is being hijacked by one country. And I, I do wonder, you know, there should be a more compelling explanation than what you just provided. Clearly, that's part of it. But from a rational, self-interested point of view, this is clearly not helping the US, I would say it's for the Europeans in particular, massively not helping the Europeans. Billions of people around the world are watching this saying, wow, this whole thing they've been talking about for decades, about rule of law, civil society, democracy, yeah. it was bullshit. They didn't mean it. Yeah, I think Israel is the last remnant of colonialism. That's why. They just want to maintain that colony in the heart of the Middle East just to use it as a hub, as a spy hub, as a an American state to um, transit their war planes in the region, to control the Middle East, to control their resources. Um, because, you know, Israel wouldn't survive without an American support financially, militarily. Um, you know, you've, you've seen these nonstop flights bringing weapons and ships bringing weapons to Israel. So, and, and most of the Israeli society, they are originally uh, foreigners. They have dual citizenship. So, that part of the world, occupied Palestine, uh, Israel, is considered uh, a foreign European Western land in the heart of the Arab world. And they just want to keep that land just as a stopover, just as a control base, spy base. Uh, I can't think of any other explanations uh, because if Israel is collapsed, this means the Jewish people, they have to go back to Europe and this will cause another problem. So they just want to keep Jews in Palestine just to make sure uh, they don't destabilize Europe or the West. So, so stop. So, what would your what would your what would the outcome be that you'd want to see in Israel? Two state solution, one state solution. One state solution is the only viable option. Two state solution is not going to work because this will not allow the refugees to go back to Palestinian state. And uh, I would like to advocate for one secular democratic state for everybody, regardless of race, ethnicity, culture, color, religion. Everybody can live in harmony and coexistence in one state with equal rights. This is the main condition. No one has a superiority over the other nation. 
and with one constitution, one parliament, the majority rules Palestine. But how realistic is that? You know, I, and I'm not saying that in like a sort of platitudinous ITV, BBC Skyway. In 1947-48, 1% of Israelis overall were Haredim, ultra-Orthodox. Uh, by 2050, you're looking at about a third of Israel is going to be Haredim. You're looking at massive polarization in Israel. So you do still have liberal Zionists or whatever. You also have, you know, real zealots, which is increasingly reflected in their government. How is that possible? Because unlike, say, South Africa, uh, and I think that the, the, the analogy isn't, it isn't always perfect for a bunch of reasons, but unlike South Africa... What's clear with Israeli civil society and Israeli politics is that in the last 20 years, it's gone far more to the right than the other way. I mean, it would have to go the other way in order for a one-state solution to be possible. So how does that fit with the present political reality of Israel? Many uh, international figures, many um, you know, celebrities, many even South Africans, they say apartheid Israel is much worse than apartheid in South Africa. The racism, the level of racism is unprecedented. Can you believe that there are some roads only for Israelis to use, Jewish to use. There are some specific symmetries for even Arab, you know, um, Arab Jews and Ashkenazi Jews or European Jews. So the discrimination, you know, uh, you know, circles, surrounds everybody, even the Israelis, you know, there is discrimination against black Jews. And I think the only uh, option uh, to force Israel to abide by international law is to impose sanctions. Because if you have a Bragg state, mm -hmm. a Bragg, you know, a spoiled child, and this child keeps taking, mm -hmm. taking without being punished, he will just, you know, revolt against you and he will not listen to you. So America keeps supporting Israel with money, financially, with weapons. And Netanyahu says to, 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 to Biden, fuck off. So sorry for that. But this is the reality. Um, so uh, Israel wouldn't abide by international law uh, uh, without, uh, be, without imposing sanctions, you know, by court divestment sanctions. When the Israelis know that they will be punished for what they are doing in Gaza, they will start, you know, changing their tactics. They will charge, they, they will try to avoid hurting civilians, but they know they will never be held accountable. That's why they just brag, destroy, kill at well. They don't care. Even uh, he has, Netanyahu has a, a big um, issue with Biden and Biden, you know, described him as a fucking ba bad guy. So there is tension relationship between Israel and the US because Netanyahu uh, is interested to stay in power because he knows that he will go to prison as soon as this genocidal war ends. And he has failed miserably to achieve his stated goals, namely to release, to release the hostages and bring an end to Hamas's rule. And also to make sure um, no uh, other uh, resistance groups is still uh, in Gaza. So uh, he is just showing off, uh, flexing his muscle, um, telling his people that I'm going to um, you know, retaliate. And this retaliation has been unprecedented. Um, Gaza needs at least 10 years to be rebuilt. To remove the rubble needs years. How about to rebuild Gaza? So what's going on is unacceptable. It's against every norm, against every convention. It's unprecedented that the international system has been sabotaged very badly and will take years to recover. Israel will, will be remembered as a, as a cruel state, as a state pariah, rogue state that you know, doesn't respect any international law. It's above the international law. It, it it exceeds all red lines. So without accountability, Israel wouldn't, uh, you know, abide by international law. So sanctions, and I think they have to realize that what they are doing is not going to lead to stability. They have to accept one state solution because they clearly say they will not accept two state solution. Mm -hmm. So let's go for one state solution. On the sanctions question, you know, I often think, is, is it actually that complicated? So people say, we need sanctions against Israel. I mean, just without, forget sanctions, just without US funding, Israel wouldn't exist. True. You know, they, they, don't, they, they don't have clean drinking water without desalination plants. They don't have a viable military without US military aid. So, you know, on sanctions, for instance, take Iran. I don't think there should be sanctions on Iran. If you look at the history of the last 30, 40 years, it has actually solidified the ruling elite. And that's because Iran has energy, has food, it can make its own weapons. It, it's, it's poorer as a result, but it's not, it's not isolated the ruling elite. It's actually made them stronger in a way. I don't think that would happen in Israel. I think yeah, san yeah. sanctions on Israel, although I don't think they're necessary, as I said, the country would collapse in, in 10 minutes because it doesn't have the things you need in order to survive. Yeah, they, 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 they cannot sustain themselves. They, they, they are relying on foreign aid, foreign assistance all the time. So this that's why I say Europe should take um, um, its role because the U.S., um, you know, is pro-Israel all the time. 
And Europe has to stand up and say to American politicians and congressmen, you know, look, you cannot just go on with your blind support to Israel because, you know, Israel, you are setting um, uh, standards that will be copied elsewhere if another war broke out. Um, so I think there has to be a change from within, from the United States, from Europe. Uh, pressure needs to be mounting um, because, uh, you know, this policy proved to be a total fiasco. It will not, it will not uh, you know, uproot the Palestinian ex existence and it will not push Palestinians to vanish. Palestinians will keep resisting. Uh, with all means available, uh, they will not raise the Wati flag. Yes, Israel can kill and can destroy, but the idea of resistance will uh, be there forever. And the Israelis have to realize that they cannot strip Palestinians' right to live in that part of the land, whereas Palestinians welcomed the Jews in the 40s. And, you know, you've seen some of those videos they were, when they were pushed from, from Europe and Palestinians received them. Is this our reward? that we welcome the Jews from Europe at the, why, in the 40s? Why can't, I mean, this is something that people say, why they, they say, oh, the Palestinians will never be, you know, removed from this land and so on, if that is Israel's ambition. And I think it's inarguably the ambition of certain people in Israeli politics, inarguably. I think at least a third of the Israeli cabinet, two of the parties in the Israeli government want to get rid of millions of people out of Gaza. I think that's that's my view. Uh, whether that's reflective of the entire, you know, government, the ruling class in Israel, we, we'll park that. But, I mean, it has been done. It has been done. In history, it's been done many times that people have been disappeared, um, that whole nations have moved from one place to another. So why, well, you're saying that the, the Palestinians will never give up, they'll, they'll always resist, but I, I understand the impulse then. I'm sure they will, they will try, but realistically, Israel has all the cards here, doesn't it? If yes. they want to, they can move those 2.5 million people in Gaza. Yeah, it can use a nuclear bomb, yeah, like one of the suggestions that to nuke Gaza and to uh, use fierce power and to open a corridor to the, through the sea to Cyprus. They are able to do that, but I think they are worried from the repercussions. Um, they might be uh, uh, worried uh, that they would be described as uh, a country that you know, pushes people towards uh, the sea or towards the desert. The desert. Um, I think the solution lies um, within the Israeli society. They have to consider us as a human beings. We have the right to live there. Uh, we are not uh, people of a lesser God. They can't maintain monopoly to their God to say they are the chosen people. We are the chosen people too. Because, you know, 75 years uh, shows that Palestinians uh, did not vanish. We are not Native Americans. We will stay there and they know it. They have uh, two, if, more, two, two million Palestinians inside Israel, and those people will maintain their Palestinian identity forever. But Islam doesn't believe in a chosen people. That's, 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 that's a powerful thing for me. And I think a lot of commentators, people talk about Judeo-Christian values and whatnot. Christianity, Islam, they are universalistic religions. Tomorrow, I can say the Shahada, I can go to a mosque, I can pray, I can do you know, Salat, and I can do all the things I'm meant to do, and I can do Hajj, and I'm a Muslim. Right, you can turn up to my church and on a Sunday you can be baptized, confirmed, first Holy Communion. Great, you're a Christian, you're a Catholic. So this idea of a chosen people for a chosen land is actually quite unique for Jewish people in Israel. It's quite unique. So, it's quite a unique claim within the international system. I don't again, I don't think people realize how unique it is actually. So if if uh, Italian people uh, came to the city of Bath in the UK and say, look, English people, this used to be an Italian city, so get out and we're going to take this land back. You cannot just claim no, that you ridiculous. existed there 3,000 years ago. Of course. Ago. No, but no, no, again, that's precisely my point. Yeah. They would say, historically, we were here. Yeah. Whereas Israelis, Jewish Israelis say, our God says this is our land. And so like when we're talking about, well, would they have, would they nuke Gaza? There are clearly people in Israeli politics, if they could, they would because they sincerely believe their divine creator gave them this land. So my point is really, we're dealing with, or one is dealing with fanatics. And it gets back to that question of the, of the one state solution. You have to be realistic. How can you share a state with hundreds of thousands of fanatics like that? How, how? It would be a permanent state of civil war. I know, I know it's difficult. Even with a settler, violent settlers, they attack Palestinian farmers, Palestinians every single day. I know, uh, I think without enforcing the law, 
these violations will continue. I, I know there is fanatic extremists. Even this uh, Netanyahu's government is the most extreme right-wing government in the history of Israel. So they have to make a decision to say, look, we have to live together. Um, that's why, you know, uh, and you have a point, you know, Israel has been working ever since for the... Uh, uh, Zionist project. So once a solution means the end of the Zionist project and they oppose it. But I think this is the only option. Like, you know, people in the UK, America, from different ethnicities, religions, we live in harmony and coexistence under one law with equal rights. So why this can't be applied in Israel-Palestine? Well, quite, I agree. I, mean, I suppose the average person, or not even the average person, the average sort of politician would say, well, the Israeli people have suffered a unique injustice with the Holocaust. But not at our expense. Why do we have to pay the price? But then they would employ sort of quote unquote pragmatic logic to say, well, they're there now and they deserve a state. And again, there's very strong logic there, experience not just of the Holocaust, but you know, best part of a millennium of, of racism in Europe. So why can't they should have a state? That's the Zionist project. You're saying the Zionist state shouldn't be in in Palestine, but you would acknowledge it should be somewhere. You know, I, I, I mean, I'm that's what saying, I would say. I'm, we don't go, when we say, because uh, this is funny, when uh, pro-Palestinians in demonstrations worldwide, they, when they say free Palestine from the river to the sea, that does not mean the elimination of the Jewish people. They still can there, live there, but why not just we live together in peace and harmony? Um, because there will never be peace. As I, I'm telling you, Palestinians will not vanish. They are not going anywhere. And those in the diaspora, uh, in the exile, about five to six million people, they still aspire to return back. They still keep the keys to their property, to their grandparents' properties in historic Palestine. And uh, this issue will not be resolved without uh, recognizing Palestinians' right to exist on that part of the land, uh, without relinquishing Israel's control of, of our Palestinian resources, without giving our, us a right in Jerusalem Al-Quds because we have Al-Aqsa Mosque, which is Islam's third holiest site. So Israel cannot, you know, con occupy and control that Islamic uh, territory. Uh, even the Christians are suffering just to make sure, just to be, um, you know, precise. Uh, three churches in Gaza were targeted. So all Palestinians have been suffering under Israel's military occupation. Um, I'm not saying that, uh, well, I don't want to go back in history and say it should or should not, but why Palestinians have to, you know, suffer miserably for the past seven decades so that Israelis can have a state? Because there were suggestions to go to Argentina or to go to Ghana in Africa. The past, what's done is done. Let's correct this historical injustice. Britain has to play a major role. Britain has to pressure Israel to abide by international law and to find a solution, really. Uh, I'm sure there's a solution. There is still hope. Well, there's two separate points. So the first is that, you know, we, we generally speaking, even within the, the liberal international system, so-called, there is apparently the right for national self-determination. So a group of people can determine they're a nation, they want to be a self-governing people. Um, and you know, we recognize that. And what Zionists would say is, well, that applies to Jewish people. We are a nation. I mean, indisputably, it's a nation. Historically, it's a very old nation. Shared language, sh shared practices, shared culture, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and we want to determine ourselves as a, as a national entity. Again, that's entirely um, congruent with a bunch of things we believe in Europe, in the US, in Asia, everywhere. Palestinians want a state because they're a people. Now, the question, the question is then, where is it? So you're talking about the Zionist project. I, I'm sorry to be sort of painful and going into detail here. Like, it might seem annoying, but it seems to me you're not opposed to the quote-unquote Zionist project because you appreciate, or do you not think that Jewish people, do, and I'm not trying, this is not a gotcha, this is not ITV or Sky, I'm trying to find out what you think. Do you not think that Jewish people deserve a state like, say, German people do, or Italians do? Or they do, do, yes, but not at our expense again. Why we have to suffer so that they can have a state? It's not fair. I mean, uh, Europe should be held responsible for creating this misery and creating this injustice for the Palestinian people. Uh, because, you know, we Palestinians also have a right in that part of the world. Um, I'm not saying that they should vanish. But as Miko Pellet said, any Jew is welcome to live in the state of Palestine. Um, you know, um, Avish Lime, you have Ian Pape, uh, you know, Gideon Levy, all these Israeli historians and politicians, they tell you that the oppression in Palestine is unprecedented. Um, you know, the, the Jews shouldn't like really allow the suffering of Palestinians to go on forever. Uh, if you are a human being, uh, if you believe in justice, then why Palestinians have to be deprived of this right to be living in a free state? In Gaza, we don't have an airport or seaport. 
Uh, Israel has been besieging Gaza. The West Bank is not any, any better. Jerusalem is being besieged. Um, I mean, it should be open to everybody. Uh, Gazans are banned for life to go and visit Jerusalem or the West Bank since the signing of Oslo Accords, which is supposed to be cre creating peace and removing obstacles and checkpoints. But since then, there has been an obstacle, uh, or a permanent uh, checkpoint called Ares between Gaza and the West Bank. So the ball is in the, Isra in, the Isra in the Israeli court. They can find a solution to this problem. But I think they are not willing to relinquish their control. They are not willing to relinquish their colonization. They are not willing to admit and recognize and compensate Palestinians for this suffering. And this is unjust. It has to end. So going back to the thing we mentioned uh, a few moments ago about the, the analogy between South Africa and, and, and Palestine, you know, people would say, well, all the things that you're saying, Aaron, or skeptics would say, were applicable to South Africa in the 1980s. And then look what happens. Um, but what I would say in response is that the whites in South Africa, who I think it's fair to say, I, I believe Israel is an apartheid state, um, but the whites in South Africa were a tiny minority who recognized that unless there was a multiracial state, they were basically going to have to leave. They were going to have to leave or they were going to lose all their property. Many of them would die. There would be a civil war. That was going to happen. Whereas in the case of Israel-Palestine, you know, you have 7 million Arabs, I think, if you include Arab Israelis, and approximately 7 million Jewish Israelis. So it's far more evenly balanced than what you have in South Africa, where it's something like 10 to 1, whites to non-whites. And, and I wonder where you have that level. We've never had a nation, a successful nation state composed like that with those levels of enmity. What has always happened, actually countries with far less enmity, like Czechoslovakia, have broken up, or obviously far more bloody was what happened in Yugoslavia. And I feel like it, it, we can talk about one state solution, that's the right thing to do. In theory, I entirely agree with you. But it just seems obvious to me that what would immediately happen is something like Yugoslavia. It would balkanize. And you'd have a two-state solution regardless, or maybe a three-state solution, who knows? Okay, well, we don't mind. We Palestinians, the, the official position of uh, the Palestinian Authority, uh, they will tell you, okay, we actually advocating for two-state solution. But what would you say if the head of state, Netanyahu himself, he say he will not allow a Palestinian state as long as he's in power? So the alternative, okay, let's go for one-state solution. They are the ones who are opposing the two-state solution, not us. Um, I agree that um, there is similarity between the, the population is um, nearly the same, seven million, seven million. But then uh, the Palestinians are not going to move. Israelis are not going to move. There must be compromises on both sides. Um, and um, the Palestinian question will be insp inspiring, will inspire the whole world. You know, we've seen these mass demonstrations. People say that they will not rest until Palestinians gain their freedom. Um, there has been many attempts to silence Palestinian voices and pro-Palestinian voices. Um, the Israelis actually, they shot themselves in the foot many times. Um, they continue waging wars and, you know, this genocidal war like no other. Uh, it's a digital uh, genocide, uh, has been broadcasted live for the past uh, four months and unprecedented that all kinds of crimes being committed. Um, you know, the Israelis, they don't look at us as a human beings. And this is the main problem. The moment they realize that we are human beings too, they might change their tactic or their they change their mentality because we are cursed in their mentality. So when they deal with us as demons, this is a real problem. You know, there must be some uh, wise people in Israel to stay to to say to those fanatics Netanyahu and his likes, stop being a fear. He's arming the settlers, Smotrich. Um, all of these people are against uh, Palestinian aspirations and uh, Palestinian state. So there must be a revolution, a change of the system. A change of the regime inside Israel. As long as those fanatics rule, then they will, they will not hear of any peaceful settlements. But there's no evidence of that, is there? I mean, if you look at, for instance, young, young Israelis, this is what scares me the most. Young Israelis are more racist towards Arabs than older Israelis. Younger Israelis are actually moving to the right very quickly. They are empowered by, by the politicians, by the no, education quite, system. You, so you said something very interesting there a moment ago. You said that Israelis don't look at us as humans. So what percentage of Israelis do you think and I'm not, you know, I'm not saying this is meant to be like a entirely accurate figure, but you know, ballpark. What percentage of Israelis do you think look at Palestinians as human? 
very small percentage. The, the, the minority, the, the Jewish voice, the so-called for Palestinians' rights, uh, I would say 5%. The vast majority of Israelis, they don't consider us as a human beings. They just, you know, um, continue to humiliate us, um, shoot Palestinians, um, you know, giving their justifications. Uh, this is the fact, you know, when when you've seen that, that video of women, they say, we're going to kill you all. Um, you know, people are being uh, stopped and checkpoints, uh, stripped naked in Gaza. Uh, children are being arrested and kept without uh, trial or charge uh, at pre pre-dawn uh, raids. Uh, you've seen all these kind of excessive force and disproportionate force being used against us. They just want to get rid of the remaining Palestinians because we are being described as the uh, most steadfast people in the world. We are resilient people. We refuse to vanish. This is the problem. That's why in their education system, they are being educated. And this was proven in many videos that you can check online that the, the call for the death of Arabs, death to Arabs. I just wonder in, in this point, what would be the reaction of Jews Arabs. Are they not worried that, you know, the Jewish people are calling for the death of Arabs because some Jews are Arabs. So this discrimination, this racism is too, is indoctrinated, uh, is deeply rooted within the Israeli society. Um, they must tackle this racism. Even pro-Palestinians, even foreigners who just would like to visit Palestine, they are stopped at, at Ben Gurion airport and they are given hard time in order to discourage them from visiting again. So what kind of treatment is that? Is this how you welcome foreigners to your country? Yeah, on the point of, um, of foreigners, I do find it fascinating. It goes back to what I said, you know, about half an hour ago, which is um, why is there such unlimited support for Israel? And if I think of the, the plight of Christians in Gaza, um, I only say that because it's 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 a story which you would have thought religious leaders in Europe would care about, uh, or the fact that when people go on, you know, make pilgrimage to Jerusalem or Bethlehem uh, or any of these various holy sites across um, uh, across that part of the world, there, there are videos of Haredim, ultra orthodox Jews, uh, spitting on people doing pilgrimage. I think it was in in Jerusalem. Yes, spat it is. On. Yes. And religious leaders, the, 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 the Archbishop of Canterbury in this country, nothing, doesn't say anything. And I find that so extraordinary. If in Iran, somebody went to an Armenian church and they were spat on by besieged Iranian police, the whole world, quite rightly, would be outraged. It would be a disgrace, an abomination. Yeah. This country has no respect for religious minorities and so on and so forth. But we, it's crickets, we don't hear anything. It just, again, to do with hypocrisy. Because uh, the UK or other un-European, they, they don't want to criticize Israel. They are afraid. They are worried. Uh, this is the thing. When Israel but why? attacked... why? It gets back to what we were saying earlier. Why? I mean, why would they be afraid? I, I don't buy that, actually. I don't buy that. I don't think the UK is afraid. It's like, just they don't want to fall under the category of being classified as anti-Semitic, uh, uh, you know, under, under anti-Semitics or anti-Jews. Again, it goes back to Nazi in Germany. The, it seems like Israel created a system, uh, a scapegoat or a, a scarecrow. Anybody who dares to criticize Israel, then fingers will be pointed at him. You know, you are anti-Jews, you are a Jew hater, self-hating Jew. Even if you are Jewish and you criticize the practice of Israel, of you'll be criticized as self-hating Jew. <laughs> so again, when they bombed three churches in Gaza, it was very shy condemnation from the Church of England and other, uh, you know, Christians worldwide. Christians were bombed and killed in Gaza. And it, was, it wasn't given that much attention. Again, you know, Israel has a right for self-defense, but this self-defense has exceeded its limits. What about Palestinians? Don't they have a right to defend themselves under occupation? They don't have a right to anything by the sounds of it. Yeah, um, unfortunately. We, we, we talked about Netanyahu. You sort of, you obliquely touched on it, so I want to explicitly talk about it. Do you think that this war being prosecuted now by Netanyahu makes Israelis less safe. In the sense of, you mean, because he's... So this is a war that's being prosecuted because it makes Israel more safe. It's to keep Israel safe. Mm. But in the long term, is it making Israel less safe or more safe? I think Israel has created tens of thousands of Hamas fighters by waging this war. Everybody wants to seek revenge now. If a child lost his parents, he will grow up and rearm and retrieve training and go and attack Israel. The policy Israel is using uh, with dealing with Gaza is very stupid to the extent that they don't know what they are doing. They have been imposing this siege for the past 17 years, and they have been pushing people towards despair, joining Hamas, because they, 
lack the food. They, they need money to survive. So Israel has to change its policies and its, its, its strategies dealing with Gaza. It cannot, you know, uh, carpet bomb Gaza and say, you know, this is collateral damage. We are not numbers. We are not collateral damage. It has the capability to strike precision strikes and kill uh, fighters rather than drop dumb American bombs in Gaza. So uh, this policy uh, is 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 not going to work. Uh, I think this war is not going to make Israelis safe. It will uh, always keep in their memories that Israel uh, suffered a heavy defeat on the 7th of October. Despite all these American support, logistics, weapons, uh, Israelis didn't expect uh, an attack would be uh, waged in this manner. And um, uh, I think those people who used to live in settlements adjacent to the Gaza border, they don't trust the Israeli army anymore. And there are calls on Netanyahu to resign because until this moment, he did not achieve any of his stated goals. And remember, um, despite the technologies, the drones, despite the balloons, despite the, the barbed wires, this did not stop Palestinians from dismantling the wall. And, you know, um, because the main instigator of this operation on the 7th of October, as everybody agrees, is because of Israel's uh, provocative attacks on Muslim worshippers during the holy month of Ramadan. In each year, Israeli settlers, Israeli army, they stormed Al-Aqsa Mosque, Islam's third holiest site. During the month of holy of Ramadan, an attack, you know, Palestinian worshippers attack women. This creates the anger and frustration. And those who committed the 7th of October operation Hamas, they wanted to revenge. What's what has been happening? In uh, it's it's a, it's an Islamic revenge because Al Aqsa Mosque means a lot to Palestinians and to all Muslims worldwide. And since Palestinians in that part of the land, they say that they have a moral responsibility to defend Al Aqsa Mosque and to represent the Muslim Ummah. That's why they say they staged that operation. And history did not start on the 7th of October. On the 6th of October, Palestinians have been suffering continuously for the past 75 years. So uh, Israel's justification from waging this war uh, to target Hamas, it has failed miserably because Hamas is still in power and they still fire rockets. And there are still Hamas police officers in the streets of Gaza. And um, uh, Israel uh, is not going to achieve uh, any solution uh, by the military. It has to be political solution. I think Hamas, is not going to go anywhere. Uh, they are able to negotiate this uh, hostage uh, prisoner swap deal. And this shows that military uh, solution is not the right option. Israelis will never feel secure as long as Israel occupies Palestinian land. This is the bottom line. Yeah, on the 7th, on the, on the 7th of October attacks, I think there's a lot to unpack there. Um, I think people just should be realistic as well. It's not supporting or condoning anything. I've condemned those attacks. I think attacks on civilians by whoever are bad. They shouldn't happen. They're almost always counter, you know, counterproductive. But what I would say as well is, you know, if and you've sadly lost family members, if I lost my daughter in a bombing and I was holding her dead body, like you're seeing on Instagram or on Twitter or Telegram, these images and videos are coming up all the time. If I was holding her dead body, I would want revenge. Of course I'd want revenge. And every single person condemning Palestinians for X, Y, Z, they would be the same. 99.9% .9 of them would seek revenge. And I, I find it really extraordinary that people don't understand this more. Some people do on the right. Peter Hitchens, I speak to him about this. He, he speaks sense. Every single building in Gaza, which is leveled, is a recruiting sergeant for Hamas. Every single one. What on earth do you think is going to result from killing thousands of children? What do you think is going to happen? Their parents will have a, a, a sense of hate and anger for the rest of their lives. If that happened to me, I would seek revenge and then I would kill myself. I would, because my daughter literally means the world to me. Every parent knows that. And yet there are parents out there supporting what's going on um, against people in Gaza. And they somehow hold these two, two beliefs. It's okay to kill children, but if that was my child, I'd seek revenge. Well, how, how's that consistent? Yeah, uh, disproportionality. Uh, I think Israel wanted to, to avenge the death of its, I don't know, over 1,200 people, but they've killed so far 32,000 civilians, including 11,000 Palestinian children. How more do they have to kill until they say 
we have had enough. That's it. We finished. We uh, so, sought uh, reprisal. This is the thing. You know, the, it seems that they are hungry for more numbers. Mm. Uh, and although they don't trust the statistics by the Ministry of Health of Gaza, but they follow these statistics. Um, so this suffering uh, of those people, um, you know, Israel made tens of thousands of orphans in Gaza and widowed women, and they destroyed much of Gaza, and they returned Gaza back to the Stone Age. Uh, those people will continue to suffer in tents because of the destruction of their homes. And they will always look at Israel from a distance and say, it was you who were responsible. We are not going to sit, sit idle and, you know, forget what you did. We will never forget Palestinians who lost their family members, homes and history, their dreams buried under the rubble. They will never forget that. And the Israelis, they have to pressure their government to, stay, to say, stop this genocide. It's madness. Uh, we have over... We used to have, before this genocide, um, 9,000 Palestinian political prisoners. Now this number is doubled. Israel has arrested over 6,000 Palestinian uh, civilians across the West Bank, including political um, you know, prisoners. So Israel keeps arresting because it knows it will have to make a, a concession and to strike a deal with Hamas to release some long-serving long uh, you know, sentences. Uh, but then there is no guarantee that it would stop uh, these arrest campaigns across the West Bank. So, in short, uh, the suffering that Israel has created in Gaza will not uh, resolve the problem and it will not lead to instability. And uh, it, it has created so much hatred. And uh, this will take years for the people of Gaza to forget the suffering, the humiliation that Israel has been inflicting on them. Uh, so much suffering. It's unbelievable. Uh, Gaza is unlivable, uninhabitable, no drinking water, no food. Uh, people now, they drink from contaminated water on, 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 the, on the streets. They fight over the sack of flour. Uh, they can't find, you know, proper shelter, no electricity, no food. Israel has returned Gazans to the back ages. Like, you know, if you think of people who lived in the desert or in, in, in very bad circumstances, we are normal hum human beings. We are being collectively punished. They have a problem with Hamas. Why they are targeting everybody in Gaza? What I find interesting as well about this whole point about the Zionist argument, and, and I, 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 I'm, I think I'm, I'm a realist on this in a sort of classical international relations sense, um, and I understand why um, European Jews after 1945 would absolutely uh, monomaniacally pursue a nation state. I, I understand all of that. I understand all of that. Um, but this claim that Israel is necessary for Jewish people to be safe, it seems to me quite obvious, actually, that Israel is the least safe place to be Jewish. Well, not everywhere. You saw pictures in Dagestan, for instance, but it's a pretty damn unsafe place to be Jewish right now. You have 1,200 people killed by Hamas in southern Israel in October. You've had 277, I believe, um, Israeli soldiers die in the subsequent war. That's very unsafe. And I find it, I do find it incredible that you have voices in this country who say this isn't a safe place to be Jewish. Yeah. In Britain, you think, hang on, have I, have I missed something? 1,200 people just died in South Israel. Apparently it's less safe here. What, because somebody said a, a chant on a demonstration you didn't like? How, how, how can any sensible person think these two things are analogous? So Israelis, they hide their identity, their passports whenever they travel to any Arab or Islamic country because they know that they will not be admitted, because people are very angry from uh, Israeli Jews. Um, I'm not talking about Israeli Arabs, because they are Palestinians and they were forced to accept the Israeli, Israeli citizenship. Um, and they know that they are not welcome, and they, they know that they will be questioned, they will be looked at uh, you know, from, you know, from a different angle. Uh, because many of those um, you, British or American uh, citizens, they fought alongside the Israeli army. And when they finished their first service, they just went back to their children, reunited with their families. God knows how many Palestinian children they killed. And that same person, he hugs his own children. So there is contradiction. You are fighting alongside Israel, but at the, at the same time, you don't care about Palestinian losses. Uh, you're fellow human beings. And then you just, you know, express your pride that you finish your service and you just go back to your normality like that guy he's from from england he was supposed to uh, be talking at one of the events 
uh, he was uh, going through women's clothing in yes, Gaza. Yes. Uh, so it's it's ironic that you know people coming from different countries across the world to go and fight uh, with the Israeli army against uh, the civilians of Gaza, and then they go back to their normality. Um, and those people but also, here. Also, why? why uh, here's a question for mm. you. Um, we people that go and fight for the YPG, for instance, in Syria and Kurdistan, they come back and they're treated as as potential terror suspects. Should that also apply to people who fight with the IDF? Maybe not terror suspects because it's a nation state. I don't like this use of terrorism with regards to nation states. It should, re it should refer really to non-state actors. But regardless, you know, if I, if I was a dual national, Iranian, British national, and I was in the Iranian army, I was in the Revolutionary Guard, and we were part of some hostile, you know, we, we, we seized the US ship. I think quite rightly, British nationals would go, why is this guy coming back here? What's he doing? What's his game? Who's he working for? That, and that wouldn't be racist. That wouldn't be anti-Iranian. That'd be quite a sensible thing to say. And yet this, like you say, is totally normal for people to fight for the IDF in Gaza, come back here, that's fine. Israel is a special case. Uh, as I say, they, they think that they have the impunity that no one is going to question them because they will never be held accountable. Um, I know uh, there is irony if you compare uh, the Israeli service and the Israeli army and those who, uh, you know, fight with them um, in Kurdistan. Uh, this shows also the disregard to the loss of Palestinian lives. Uh, Palestinian lives don't matter to many of the Western world. That's why those Israeli soldiers from the UK, they are hailed as heroes who are fighting Hamas. But then when they kill civilians and animals in Gaza, this does this make them heroes as well? For those people who are in the UK, when they say they are worried to uh, reveal their Jewish identity because of the pro-Palestinian, I think this is a way to uh, blackmail and extort the government here to get more funding, to get more protection, just to raise the the, the issue of, you know, um, that the Jewish people are under a threat all the time. It's It's a way to you know, to um, generate sympathy towards them and um, to support Israel indirectly to say, look, look, you know, Jews are being attacked worldwide because of what's happening in, in Gaza. It's actually Palestinians who should be worried. You know, now uh, we, we Palestinians, uh, we should be given the extra attention that we suffer psychologically. Uh, those people, you're talking about 2.5 million people, they need urgent psychological attention. You're talking about non-stop four months of bombardment, tank shilling, uh, deprivation of sleep, drones. Those people, if they are flooding Europe, it will be a big crisis. So the whole world should intervene and put an end to this suffering and pressure Israel to stop these violation and stop this genocide and, and heed the call of people for ceasefire. It's enough. You mentioned the Balfour Declaration a while ago from 1917. Uh, for people who are interested in that, an interview with um, uh, Rashid Khalidi about um, uh, all these things. He wrote a great book about this, about century-long war on, on the people of Palestine. Um, on the matter of history, does it surprise you? Now, you've been in Britain for 10 years. Does it surprise you that people in this country aren't more familiar with the history, given Britain's role in the whole thing? And, and I ask that because <clears throat> people always say to me, will you condemn Hamas terrorism? I say, happy, happy to. Very happy to condemn any attacks on any civilians. Very happy mm. to. Will you condemn the Zionists' um, terrorism, that's all it can be described as, in the 1940s with the Urgen, the Haganah, they were called the... Uh, the, the Lehi, the Stern Gang. Um, will you condemn those guys? They were involved in the King David um, Hotel bombing. 22, I think, 22 British nationals died that day. They hanged. They hanged UK soldiers. They were hanged. Yeah, in 47, yeah. By yeah. terrorists. Mm. Zionist terrorists. They hanged them. Very good in Haganah, yeah. And, and it's, it's remarkable to me. They said, will you condemn Hamas? Hundreds of UK service personnel died over there. Hundreds. And th but there's no historical memory of any of this. And of course, go further back, Balfour Declaration and so on. Why do you think that is? And, and secondly, do you think it's better? Do you think younger people, because you've got this huge Instagram following, you know the kinds of people that follow you better than I do, better than anybody does. Is that sense of history improving? And finally, long question, sorry. Is that because of social media? You know, social media gets a really hard time. People bash it. But actually, is it opening up people's eyes to the historical reality of the situation? 
Indeed, yeah, it's very important medium. Uh, social media has uh, opened the world's eyes and it it is raising awareness. So many young people are interested to learn more about the root causes of the problem. And it's young people who are interested, you know, they publish videos on TikTok and Instagram and um, other uh, media platforms. Um, uh, I think we are seeing more people who are becoming pro-justice, pro-Palestinians, because they cannot accept the fact that, um, you know, Palestinians continue to suffer um, as a result of uh, Britain's uh, unjust declaration of Belfort Declaration. Uh, that's why they say not in our names. Even Jewish people say not, not in our names. Um, so many Jewish voices are growing. Uh, and also, the world cannot tolerate Israel's um, occupation anymore. Uh, Palestine, probably the only country uh, with Kashmir, are still occupied. Uh, and it, it's the last remnant of colonialism. And uh, people would like to see a change. I think some governments in the West, mainly, for example, the UK, they invest millions to uh, push for, prevent, for example, uh, doctrine or uh, to education system to make it less possible to criticize Israel and to silence Palestinian voices. We've seen the uh, remarks and statements by Rishi Sunak and his uh, pre previous uh, Home Office Minister. You know, it's a clear, this, you can see and you can tell that they are pro-Israel, whereas Palestinians, they are not giving the full attention. The, the focus is on the war of Hamas. What, what about the suffering of Palestinians? Forget Hamas. Hamas didn't exist 30 years ago. And if, if Israel was able to crush Hamas now, the idea of resistance will continue in the minds of Palestinians. You are not going to force Palestinians to relinquish the idea of liberation and freedom. And uh, um, if you are neutral, neutral in situations of injustice, then you choose the side of the oppressor. And as uh, Mandela said, um, our freedom is incomplete without the freedom of the Palestinian people. The whole world would now would like to see Palestinians free and liberated. So the Western government, whatever they do, they will not succeed to silence the voices of young people. Social media is here to stay and it will turn the tide. It'll it will turn the tide. Social media will turn the tide. It will, yeah, it will have a, a, a you know, a huge impact. It will change people's perception of what's going on in Palestine. The root causes of the problem, the occupation, the ethnic cleansing, the catastrophe of 1948. So many people are learning now and they are sharing their own experiencing. That's why there's interest to follow accounts who are raising awareness. We are not inciting any, against anybody. We are not calling for the elimination of the Jewish people. We're just raising awareness. You know, we are conveying the truth. We're exposing the crimes. This is our role as journalists, and we will continue to be the voice of the voiceless. Because, I mean, you have three quarters of a million followers on Instagram. Uh, almost a million, 800K. 800K. I mean, it's grown a lot, right, actually, since we spoke to you. There is interest to learn more about what's going on because the, the traditional Western media, they don't show you all the videos coming from Gaza. Social media is um, a platform through which people can find solace. You know, you, you can see un, unfiltered, unedited materials and videos being broadcasted, whereas BBC, of course, they have to, you know, any material has to go through editing and filtration and, you know, use that terminology, don't use that terminology, killed, murdered, um, Hamas, uh, terrorism. So social media is, is, is influencing a lot of people, especially the young people. And do you think that's part of the reason why legacy media outlets want to sort of discredit it sometimes? Because vested interests actually benefit from how reporting has been conducted over the last several decades? Yeah, I think because um, social media is not regulated and uh, those broadcasters, they accuse social media uh, platforms of, of uh, to allow fake news. There is reason they have been broadcasting propaganda and, uh, you know, uh, failed PR campaigns and false uh, videos. And the world debunked those videos, especially that spokesperson who said there is a timetable behind me. You know, People can tell which is genuine video and which is propaganda video. People wouldn't believe there is really propaganda anymore because they have been debunked. Palestinians are the victims. This is the end of the story. Israel cannot claim to be the victim. Israel is the victimizer, the oppressor, and Palestinians are the victims of this unjust occupation. I suppose of the, the 1,200 people who died on October 7th, clearly they are victims and clearly their families are victims. If they said to you, Yusuf, I, that's not right, we are victims, what would you say to them? I'm against the killing of any civilian. 
they suffer. Palestinians also suffer. But the number of Palestinians is way too higher than the Israeli side. So Israel cannot justify its revenge by continue killing more and more and more. Enough, enough bloodshed. I feel sorry for the loss of the loved ones, but I lost my sister, I lost my nephews and nieces. Are they sorry for me? Do they criticize their government for being so arrogant and so extreme by dehumanizing us? Are they willing to take to the streets and revolt against Netanyahu? Are they willing to call for the release of Palestinian political prisoners? This is the question. It has to be balanced. It has to be both way. They cannot expect us to be anti-Hamas while they are not willing to be anti-Netanyahu, anti anti-extremism, anti-settlers, anti and so on and so on. Because you cannot ask for too much from people under occupation. You have to support Palestinians' right to be free without occupation and colonization. You mentioned Hamas. Are they the best people to be leading Gaza right now? I, I think people would like to have a normal life. Um, they were elected, but I don't think they have the uh, capability now or the popularity. Uh, obviously, Israel wants you to know, to believe that they are the bad guys. Um, people have been suffering under Israel's occupation, as I say. And the majority of people would like to go to back to normality. They have support in Gaza, but I'm not sure what's the percentage. Are they still enjoying popularity or not? We need to carry on, um, you know, polls. We need to make, um, you know, questionnaires. We need to, because I, I haven't seen demonstrations in, in the streets of Gaza calling to revolt the, the regime. Uh, I, I haven't seen much suffering, um, you know, look. But then the, so a critic, sorry, a critic would say, well, that is precisely why they're a problem because they rule with such an iron fist that you can't see protests opposing them. This is very thorny. Uh, Israel wants the people of Gaza to revolt against Hamas. Hamas has been ruling Gaza um, ever since they were elected in 2006. I know there has been anti-Hamas. Uh, there is a lot of people that dislike Hamas. But those people who now, who are losing their loved ones, they don't talk about Hamas anymore. They talk about Israeli killing and Israeli terrorism. So Israel, as I said, it's counterproductive. Uh, it, it, it causing the, uh, the other people around. It Now, instead of inciting people to uh, call for the toppling of the regime in Gaza. Now Israel has to deal with more people who are who wants to seek revenge. Um, I know the international community wouldn't deal with Hamas anymore. Uh, it's up to the Palestinian people to go to elections and choose who's going to represent them. Uh, I know many people are not happy with Hamas, uh, but they are still in power. And Israel couldn't uproot Hamas for the past 17 years. So do you expect the people of Gaza to call them to resign or to topple them by, you know, peaceful methods. Israel has been using its military might and Hamas is still powerful. So it has to be a political one. I think the they should be part of any solution. You know, mar mar marginalizing them is not going to resolve the issue. But on, on this issue, you know, I think, again, it's just, it, it really um, underscores the, the lack of pragmatism amongst sort of foreign policy elites in the UK and Europe and the US, you said they have to be part of the solution. I think that's obvious. Um, just as the Taliban had to be part of a solution in Afghanistan, yeah. that was rejected for 20 years and look what happened. Um, there is just this lack of just realism that actually, if you look at political leaders after the Second World War, they had so much more pragmatism, um, partly because they'd obviously gone through a major conflict. They understood you have to make compromise. And there are things that happen when you don't make compromise, like bloodshed. Uh, but that feels a, a world away. On the issue of Hamas, quickly though, what's the role of, of Iran in all this? Because you said that they're still very strong. Um, obviously, it's very hard to get things in of, inside Gaza, to get things out of Gaza. There was obviously previously these tunnels. There's less of them now, although I'm, of course I'm sure they still operate in certain places. Uh, so where does that strength come from? I don't mean their political strength. I mean their literal resources to have firearms, to be able to eat, access clean drinking water and so on. Is that because of Iran? Well, it's, it's secretive. I, I can't tell how they are able to maintain their military capabilities. They, they make these homemade rockets internally, relying on what uh, what means available from materials and so on. Israel says that the Hamas is relying on tunnels. That's why they are asking Egypt to... Uh, dig a uh, deep wall and to fortify their 12-kilometer uh, uh, border. Um, they obviously said it clearly that they thank Iran for giving them the logistics and support and the experience. 
um, no one knows how they get their capabilities and uh, the gliders and so on. Um, they were able to maintain their um, expenses and costs through the taxation, through ruling Gaza. Um, uh, so Iran has played a major role in strengthening Hamas's existence in Gaza. And uh, they said many times that they are thankful. Um, so Hamas is considered a terrorist organization by many of the Western governments, by Israel, by the Quartet, uh, even by some Arab countries. But um, one day the IRA was considered a terrorist organization. And then, you know, IRA sat down with the British government and they struck, struck a deal. So Hamas should be part of any peaceful settlement. Israel cannot and will never, you know, beat the idea of resisting, resistance. Because, as I said, if Israel, if Hamas is vanished, you will have Islamic Jihad, you will have PFLP, you will have more other new uh, factions and organizations will take the lead again. Uh, because, as I say, people believe in the right in that part of the world. And uh, uh, one man's terrorist is uh, another man's freedom fighter. Mm, and I mean, this is something which I think is lost on a, on a big part of our audience, not our audience, but audiences in Europe and North America is that there are people, if you don't like Hamas, there are people quote unquote worse than them. Um, and I think it's it's the same in, with the Taliban and Afghanistan, going back to that again, I would, obviously I wouldn't, would never defend the Taliban, it'd be ridiculous. But um, if you look at, for instance, ISIS in, in Central Asia, they seem to be objectively worse. Um, again, you know, look at Iran. Um, Iran has had attacks by Islamic fundamentalists in that in that part of the world. Would I want to live in a country where you have, um, you know, Ayatollah Khamenei as a supreme leader? Not really, uh, but equally, I, I I probably prefer that to ISIS. So I think concessions I, have to be made. Things that, yeah. and also things can always get worse, right? People say, "Oh, Hamas, you can't deal with them." It is perfectly possible there is a world where there is yeah. somebody worse than Hamas, exactly, with their kind of political influence. And that's possible. And I know that they changed their constitution uh, some years ago. And they said, uh, Khaled Mash'al, the political leader of the organization, he said he is willing to um, accept a Palestinian state on lands occupied in 1967. So yeah. they took a pragmatic stance. And um, yeah, and I think Israel was using Hamas to maintain its borders for some time. Hamas said they are willing to go for a long truce, long term truce and ceasefire. And it is in Israel's interest that a powerful, a powerful regime rules Gaza. Imagine if Hamas falls out and and um, insurgency and foreigners come from Sinai, from all over the world, from Libya, from Afghanistan. Israel would 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 face a crisis. So it's in the interest of Israel and Palestinians to have uh, a powerful authority, whether it's the PA or any other organizations, because if chaos happened, Israel would would, would suffer. Um, and they were relying, as I said, on Hamas, and they were watching Hamas jeeps and military men, you know, just literally meters from the border fence. And they were, um, they're kind of trust between both sides. Um, so uh, I think, uh, is for me as a Palestinian, I would like to see prevail, uh, peace prevail. I would like to live in prosperity. I would like my children to grow up in a, a normal environment, healthy environment. I would like to be able to visit the West Bank and Jerusalem. And I don't mind that we live in one state, you know, look, Palestinians have had enough. We have had enough from wars and destruction. You know, uh, life is too short. And the Israelis have to admit that they will never feel secure. This is the bottom line. I don't know why they are big headed. They have to admit that, look, you know, the occupation has to end. The siege has to end. We must treat Palestinians equally. We must live, you know, in this part of the land. Um, now, I know both people from both sides, they, would, they wouldn't agree to live side by side. I know that people, extremists, they, they, they would call for the elimination of Hamas or the resistance or the elimination of the Jew Jewish people. But the majority would go for ceasefire. The majority would go for um, an independent Palestinian state. What do you make of the recent ICJ ruling? It was symbolic and we expected it that it, it wasn't going to force Israel to abide by international law. Uh, it made a uh, media stunt, uh, but it was uh, very important step that Israel was tried for the first time. It was brought from its neck to The Hague. And this is something really that we can build on. And um, this shows that the international community, uh, there was majority votes, 15 to one or 15 to two. This shows that the world, you know, cannot tolerate Israel's, you know, practices. It's it's inhumane, uh, it's, it's illegitimate acts. Um, 
And I think the Israelis were worried and they rejected uh, the, the rulings and they accused South Africa of being the political wing of Hamas. So Israel is not happy from any um, pro-Palestinian stand, stance, whether it's peacefully or non-peacefully. It's too much to talk about, but um, you know, there is so much frustration, there is so much hopelessness and people are losing the hope in the sense that they say the international community has abandoned the Palestinian people because of the hypocrisy and, and double standard the policy. So what do you think the ICJ was, was it a disappointing ruling then or? People were expecting the ICJ uh, ruling to call uh, explicitly for ceasefire and a stop to the genocide. This did not uh, do that. It was disappointing, yes. But um, when people realized that it was a symbolic positive step, then, but it doesn't mean anything for the Palestinians of Gaza. What What is more important now is to stop the bloodshed and to allow humanitarian aid and to go back to normality. Final question. Um, we obviously have an election in 2020 where Donald Trump, incumbent president, loses. Joe Biden enters the White House. Uh, Trump had a particularly close relationship to Israel, particularly through his son-in-law, Jared Kushner. You have the Abraham Accords and whatnot. And yet... You one, one can make the argument that actually Joe Biden since 2020 has been a worse president in terms of the interests of Palestinian people than Donald Trump. What's your view on that? I think I believe uh, all American presidents are different faces for the same currency, different people, but same policy. And we don't expect anything good when it comes to Palestinians. We know that Israel has been um, the closest ally to the, to the United States. We know that the Israeli lobby, IPAC, is very active there. At, at, to a certain point, Palestinians believe that Israel is ruling the, the USA to the extent because, you know, the American administration blindly support Israel with money, weapons, logistics, and, you know, with the veto at the UN Security Council. Um, so it doesn't matter who's ruling the, the US actually. Uh, what's more important for the Palestinians is that they want to see a change, a real change, uh, a change in the foreign policy, uh, a change in the sense that um, they shouldn't you know, grant Israel impunity forever. Why the um, Americans have to pay tax their tax money to finance uh, an Israeli occupation. The US is pro prolonging the Israeli occupation. And this is um, a big problem. And so many Americans are rising up against this. So. Uh, somebody who would disagree probably with a great deal of what we've said on, on, on this interview so far, they'd be watching. You said a comment there, Israel controls American politics, or it could be perceived as controlling American politics, is what you were saying. They would say that's anti-Semitic, the idea that Israel has this outsourced role in US politics. I mean, I, I think- How would that be anti-Semitic? It's a hugely powerful lobby. Well, they would say the idea, the idea that Israel, uh, what is it, 10 million people? Nine million people. Yeah. The idea that Israel controls the United States, 300 million plus people, that is anti-Semitic. Any American official who wants to reach power, he will be uh, supported and given the money uh, in order to make sure that he or she will defend Israel. So many of the candidates during the election campaigns, they will be bribed. They will be paid money just to make sure, just to buy their, their his or her uh, stance. Um, this is what Palestinians say, not necessarily uh, be, be true, but we can see that, you know, the American administration has never been in favor of Palestinians. It has always been in favor of Israel. And this gives the impression that it is the Israelis uh, who actually have so much influence to the extent that American officials, they don't criticize Israeli officials. Regarding Trump and Biden, do you think it's possible Trump could actually be better than Biden? On this, I mean, people, you know, you're, you're saying they're all the same. Somebody said something quite interesting to me, which is um, Trump actually has a sense of the US national interest. You know, he says America first, often, you know, it doesn't necessarily behave in that way, but that's, that's his message. There's a very strong impulse now within a minority of Republican voters, not majority, but a strong minority now. They don't want to give more money, more arms to anybody, Ukraine or Israel. And it seems to me that. Um, I actually I agree with you, they're, they're both broadly the same. Rashid Khalidi said the same thing, which is actually if you were to see a slight change, not a massive change, a slight change in policy from the US about putting America first, not just giving Israel carte blanche everything it wanted, actually, it's not a reason to vote for the guy, 
But actually, that's more likely to come from Trump than Biden. What's your read on that? I think Trump would have been much better, uh, although he helped uh, moving the American embassy from Tel Aviv to Jerusalem, and uh, he helped Netanyahu a lot. But I think he would make um, some decisions to say, look, I cannot allow you, Netanyahu, to uh, take American money just for to serve your own interest. Because uh, Netanyahu, he's a selfish person, and he doesn't care about the interest of, 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 his, of his own people. Only all what he wants, only uh, what he cares for is his reputation. He wants to be remembered as a tough Israeli guy who was able to achieve a lot with the help of the Americans. So I think Trump might have been a much better president uh, dealing with this crisis between Gaza and, uh, and the Israelis. Yeah, Khalidi's read on that was really interesting. He said, I think that Trump 2016 to 2020 is better than Biden 2020 to 2024. But maybe Trump after 24 would be worse than Biden and Trump before. Who knows? But I, I think it's pretty clear that Biden hasn't been an upgrade when it comes to this stuff. No, no, I, I don't think he has He has got the right personality. I mean, uh, Trump, as, as I say, uh, would have made uh, much uh, wiser decisions when it comes to sending uh, and arming Israel. And, uh, you know, this war has been ongoing. This genocide has been ongoing for almost four months. And this consumes a lot of the Americans, you know, energy, and it has uh, tarnished the image of the U.S. administration of being of complicit in this genocide. And Americans' mentality is business. So when uh, Trump uh, says, I'm going to give you money in return for something, then uh, he wouldn't change his mind. But Biden, I think it's like open a check, yeah. open tab. Yeah, with Trump, it's transactional. That's not always a bad thing. Uh, Yosef Al-Hallu been such a pleasure talking today. Thanks for coming on Downstream. Thank you for having me.